Good morning, folks. This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 18 of Arrow 4080. Today we're going to be looking further at how to model structures with Nastran, and we're going to be focusing on some special cases. We're going to start by taking a look at some examples of some models that have been used practically out there in industry for various applications and uh, take a quick look at some of the challenges and uh, uh, benefits of debugging those. And then we're going to look at a few Nastran cards and talk about some best practices. Let's get started. So first, uh, as we look at practical modeling of aircraft structures that's been done, this is an example of, uh, this is a fairing off of a Delta III. This shows the model. This is the, uh, these are all quad elements, and you can see the fineness of the mesh that's needed in order to capture a buckling allowable, uh, buckling um, kind of number. So we saw just a lecture or so ago how to analyze buckling to find out at what loads or what factor of our current loads a structure will become unstable. And this particular structure was loaded with um, with pressure basically as it moves through the atmosphere. You get a, there's an internal pressure and then there's a leeward and a windward pressure that develops that causes a pressure distribution on the fairing. And then you also have some crush pressures on the thing, uh, some inertial forces. And what that does is that buckles the cone at a certain value in this particular case with a no test factor of 2.0 against our design loads we're showing just a very tiny positive margin for buckling of the conical section and this is just good practice you can actually do this right in your model you've been learning how to calculate margins of safety and a lot of times when folks are doing five element models the folks that do the modeling don't understand that concept but you can actually uh, either augment your output. And this is uh, one of the areas where a lot of times I prefer extracting loads from the FO6 file and writing margins of safety on that rather than plotting the pretty pictures. But there are places where plotting those pretty pictures can be quite insightful. In this particular case, those pressures cause a very tiny displacement. And usually when FEMAP and Patron are showing displacements, they're going to magnify them by some large number, a hundred or a thousand or something, so that you can actually see how it's deflecting, even though you'd hardly see those deflections. And that's what's happening here. And this is a dynamic solution. So actually all it's doing is taking the little eigenvalue and the tiny deflection that occurs with that and then magnifying it. So you can kind of see what the mode shape is. We can see this is going into a sinusoidal mode shape. And the places where those eigenvalues are the smallest are the places where it's red. That's where the deflection is the most, place where the eigenvalue is the smallest. And because it's the softest point in the model and it's going into a mode shape. Remember how with uh, buckling the panels, we saw that scalloped approach as we move from mode one to mode two to mode three to mode four and so on. And in three, two, seven, one. We see the same kind of thing, and you'll remember back when we looked at cylinders, we saw a similar thing under certain kind of loads. And here that's what we see here, since we have a pressure load, that's the mode shape that's typical of a pressure load. And we can see with those uh, where it's critical. You can notice the cylindrical portion is not critical. One of the reasons for that is the pressure there was quite a bit lower. Um, it's not that it's less, it's more stable, it's that the pressures were lower and therefore for the design pressures, uh, which are much higher on the cone because of the shape, that's where we get the failure and, uh, or the, the closest to failure in this particular case. So in this case, I augmented my finite element model with the information that I thought was pertinent, the margin of safety, what the type of failure it is, this is a linear buckling, buckling failure and what the Mach number, what the uh, load case was that drove it. In this case, it was Mach 1.2 uh, crush. Make sense? So that's how we do that. And uh, so what you're going to extract out of Nastran, if you had done, uh, if you had done, uh, and we're using, uh, if you had done, uh, and we're using a little knockdown factor, gamma, 
is a 0.75 knockdown factor. That's just a factor that was defined in, uh, I think it's actually in the mill standard as well, but on Delta we used a knockdown factor against buckling. So we reduced the eigenvalue a bit just to be conservative, to put a little extra 25% margin in our number. So basically what you get out of Nastran is for the design loads that we applied, we get a minimum eigenvalue of 1.337 and it occurs right there where that red spot is. And, uh, and the reason it's more critical there at the red spot and not on the other side, remember we have a windward and a leeward pressure. Basically what that means is if you look down on the thing, because we have an internal pressure and we have an external pressure, we get a pressure due to the wind. If the wind is coming this way. We end up with a large crush pressure here. And that crush pressure is offset by the internal pressure. What we end up with is a, like a sinusoidal distribution of pressure acting like this. So this is the pressure that I applied. Actually, what I did was our loads guys gave me what the pressure distribution of distribution of pressure was all across the fuselage. I mapped those numbers. I wrote a Fortran program. Actually, uh, one of my predecessors on the program wrote a Fortran program, and then I utilized that and modified it for my purposes. Uh, he was actually quite a good uh, stress analyst from what I can tell. Um, but anyways, what we did was then map those pressures to the quad element so that each quad element has its own pressure on it, and that ends up applying the pressure. Now the pressure is different all throughout the fuselage. Since we got an eigenvalue of 1.337, what that means is if you uh, looked at your FO6 file, the minimum eigenvalue would be 1.337. All the other eigenvalues would be larger. And right here is corresponding where the eigenvalue is the smallest is corresponding with where this pressure was the highest. So you'll read Nastran or even if you print out the eigenvalues for all your elements you get a bunch of eigenvalues all of them are smaller than this except for one or sometimes a few in this case one eigenvalue. So then what you say is okay that's my minimum eigenvalue in this case we're applying a knockdown factor which we're saying the eigenvalue times that knockdown factor so we're multiplying it by this. This just introduces a 25% conservatism that we used. We also, oh, one other thing is uh, what we did, we took the max pressures given to us by loads and we multiply them by our factor of safety, right? This is what I applied to the model. The factor of safety multiplied by this pressure distribution. That's what's applied to this model. And then you get the eigenvalue. Now, if we had not applied the factor of safety, we would have had to adjust this eigenvalue for the factor of safety. But since I applied it to the forces on the model and pressures and all that, then the eigenvalue is the actual eigenvalue. We happen to use an additional conservative factor, this uh, gamma 0.75. That means we multiply this by this and then subtracting that. Now, what this means is, what the model is predicting is if you apply 1.337 times the design loads, which in this case was the factor of safety times the pressure distribution, if you multiply that by this, then you will be zero margin of safety against buckling. That's what it implies. However, we're using this additional conservative factor, which means we're actually reducing this eigenvalue further and then that's the number of times you can multiply your applied loads by before you get failure. So the margin of safety is simply the eigenvalue times any knockdown, or that's the eigenvalue there, times any knockdown factors. This is the eigenvalue. This is the knockdown factor. And minus one, that's your margin of safety. That's how we compute this margin of safety. So what this says is this particular structure can withstand two times uh, two times and then uh, 1.5 times, right? Point seven or 1.333, 1 over 0.75 is 1.3. So this can take two times 1.333 times whatever the max design loads are, the limit loads. That's what this can take before it buckles. That sounds like pretty safe design. The reason we're using a factor of safety of two 
rather than the typical 1.5 is because this structure, we didn't test this load case. We did test this fairing, but not for this load case. So that's the kind of ways that we're going to use this stuff in uh, Nastran. And then you'll notice here, remember I taught you how to augment, how you can place, uh, you can place mm, comments in your deck, in your FEMAP model. So that's what I did here. This is a comment in the FEMAP model. I just drop that in there and I drop this information in the FEMAP model to make it clear. And then this information I put in my, when I copied this into my report page, that's where I added this kind of information. So that's kind of the way to demonstrate uh, what we are, our analysis. Okay. Here is a fairing. This is a fairing, and uh, I think this is a Delta IV fairing. And this was actually a discrepant analysis when they were building these fairings. They had a little uh, crack when they did the ultrasound. They found a little cracked area. And so in order to substantiate that, what I did was I uh, modeled the baseline fairing with no damage. And then I simulated that gap crack in the model and then I compared the two results to show. Uh, so you'll see uh, the uh, meridional and the hoop direction. And for the blueprint uh, or the non-damaged uh, payload attached fitting, I had a margin of safety of 0.37. And then I went ahead and in this case, we looked at the max stresses and we show what the margin of safety is. Actually, I misspoke. I said we compared uh, a uh, the two numbers. Actually, a lot of times I'll do that and I'll come up with a factor showing that it makes negligible difference. In this particular case, what I did was take the baseline margin of safety. You can see the critical running load. These are a plot of the running loads, the pounds per inch all throughout in the meridional direction and in the hoop direction. I took the max value of that in each direction. I compared to the baseline value and for the baseline fairing, uh, payload attach fitting and for the discrepant pay, payload attach fitting and then demonstrate in this case, not the comparative number, but I just demonstrated that it could still withstand all the design loads. So this is the way that we do this kind of analysis. This is a cool model. I actually didn't create this model. This was uh, one of our other analysts who did this one. This is of the SureCEP. So, and I think this was when I was on the Delta IV. I can't recall. So what we did, uh, the inner stage, remember that surrounds the second stage engine and it drops away before you fire the second stage engine. And the way it drops away is the SureCEP. We fire ordnance that's in that gap in the middle here right in this region right here and what that does is because what we have is a we have a little uh, steel tube in here filled with ordnance so when the ordnance uh, fires the gases expand and this thing goes round when this goes round it pushes on all sides which pushes these flanges out and you've noticed we made a weak spot here which is blown up in this view here that's a view of that right there. And what happens is that develops shear in the shear. The shear is right through here. It's designed to shear. And then the inner stage, which is a, this structure down here, can fall away. And this is the skirt hanging on the upper piece. So we have the fairing and the lock skirt with the shear sep and the inner stage. So when this ordnance fires around this joint, all of this with all the rest of the rocket that's attached here falls away and that leaves just what that does is when that falls away stage and all the rest of the structure falling away and then this can fire and this can move this way so that's the sure step occurs right there that's where this thing happens right in the cross section through there
Does that make sense? A cross section. I think our cross section looks something like uh, this before separation. Okay, so you'll notice here in this particular model, you'll notice here that in order to get the details of how this shears off, we need a much finer model than usual. So what that means is we've got these little brick, actually this is uh, uh, not a Nastran model, this is an Abacus model. Abacus is another program similar to Nastran that's very good at picking up uh, these kind of details and it has great axisymmetric properties. What an axisymmetric model is, if you have a cylindrical structure, so you, one cross section is the same all the way around 360 degrees, then actually you can just model with an axisymmetric pro program that deals with axisymmetric structure models, structures, you can just model through the thickness one little strip. What that means is if we have a if we have a structure like this, let's say a rocket structure like this with an engine down here, all we have to do is model one through thickness strip, all of the details of that strip. And if we model that in detail, what Nastra, uh, what Abacus in this case will do is it will spin that around 360 degrees. It applies constraints to the edges of this that only allows it to deflect in these directions because of symmetry. So it can deflect in plane but not out of plane. That's that simulates that at that symmetric or axis symmetric symmetry about an axis nature. Abacus is great at that. And has great properties. So usually, when we did access, uh, when we needed an axis metric model, we would make abacus. And in this case, we're using Patran to pre and post process our abacus. You can also use FEMAP to do that, where we were using Patran, as most aerospace industry does. So what that means is, instead of making a very coarse model, a lot of times we would just model each of these with quads. Now we've got little axis symmetric elements, little brick elements that just uh, have their properties in plane and you'll notice we've got the through thickness details here and this is continuous we've got constraints up here that simulate the way that's attached constraints down here to simulate that this is continuous and then all the details here and then this this little joint here uh, is uh, probably just welded together now if we needed to look at stresses through this fastener then this Part of the model gets very complicated. They probably just attach these parts all together as if they were attached on these planes, which is not true, but it probably simulates good enough for what we're trying to do. Actually, what they should have done is left this through here unconnected because, as you can see, if that's connected, it bends like this, but if it's not connected, it might bend like that. It might bend out much sooner, all the way at the bolt head rather than all the way out here. So little details like that can affect this model. And then these, a little sheer stiffness of these elements here is what drives that. And then what they would have done is applied a, uh, like I said, I didn't make this model, but I think he applied a pressure like this in here, which uh, he then simulated what that uh, pressure was so that we demonstrate that that fails. So there are two things we have to do with this kind of model. First, we have to apply our design loads to it to make sure that this won't fail under our design loads. And then we have to uh, simulate that this will actually fail. Now, a lot of times uh, in this particular case, since we tested this, we actually construct a little piece like this and put the ordinance in it and expanded that through test then it's not necessary then to use the model to verify that part. We can just use the model to verify that this little thing will not fail under the design loads that go through here. And we rely on the test to show that it actually operates the way that it's supposed to. So that's the way that kind of stuff works. And that's the way our finite element model can be used to solve that kind of problem. <clears throat> this is a... Uh, a um, finite element model of the nose of an MD-11 that I created in the early 90s when I was a young buck uh, about your age or just a fraction older. Maybe I was around 26 or 8 at that time. 
and uh, this all these are quad elements we have bar elements for the frames and bar elements for the inner costals tying these together with some other little details here's another uh, this is the way and, and what we were using this for is we'd already designed this this was basically near identical to the MD-11 uh, uh, excuse me, it's nearly identical to the DC-10, so we didn't need to do, redo the primary structure analysis, but there were some rap rapid decompression requirements. So what we did was I applied pressures on all the interfaces, the, uh, the compartments, so that we get the right distribution of pressure and we could evaluate the frames and the floor beams and the interfaces and those kind of things. So that's the way this model was created. Here's a couple more views. This is uh, rotated view of the model and this is the floor that's in that part of the structure the cockpit is this is the cockpit uh, area and the first couple floor beams at the passenger door here's another view you'll notice here uh, this gets back to some other things we've talked about just a little bit this is the model this is what I was, what I was analyzing but in order to get good loads here, to have the internal forces and, and stuff be appropriate, we can't just fix the model here. If I had just fixed the model here, no matter how hard I tried, that model would be too constrained to give the right uh, forces and stresses in nearby the end of that thing. So what I did, I created what's called dummy structure. I included a part of the, mod of the fuselage model attached all that uh, and all of this I wasn't looking at any of the results in this was modeled ex uh, as the structure is it was constrained here with a wagon wheel we're going to talk about how that is so this acts like a uh, like a cantilever beam and all of this structure was added to my model and it was loaded just like the structure I was looking at but what it is is called dummy structure because we're not looking at any of the results in that part of the model. That's just there in order to make sure that the boundary condition, by the time we get here, because a very thin skin structure doesn't have a lot of support. It only has support in certain directions in order to simulate that best. The best way is to put a dummy structure that's about the size. So if this diameter is 180 inches, then you'd want this dummy structure to be about 180 inches uh, and or more. So usually if you have about this big of a model, you want to go about that far behind the model, right? Rotate that on end and go about that far further before you constrain it. That way, any mistakes you make in constraining, any over or under constraining at the end of the model, all of the effects dampen out out here. By the time you get to this interface, your loads in the model should be accurate all through here they should be good in fact your load should be a good all from here forward and i was just looking from here forward so that's how we can make a model and separate the model we need from the constraints that uh, rarely quite match reality but this dummy structure gives time for any effects to dampen out now if we want to look at this part of the structure we would have put more dummy structure on before we constrain the model. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's some ideas for you guys there. Uh, let's see, let's turn this back off. All right. Then you got property. So this is just a little excerpt from my write-up on how to calculate the property. So if we have a floor beam, if we look at a cross-section of the floor beam, the floor beam for these kind of structures usually we have an extruded upper cap often it's a J section and then we have a super thin skin or web which often has cutouts and then a lot of times we'll have a little angle on the bottom that way we can attach things to this we'll attach stiffeners like this and so on so because of this now we can actually come up with quite a lot of structure to model this but what we often do is, is uh, just model this with like a rod and a rod and a shear panel. That's what you see, a rod and a rod and a shear panel that represents that cap, this cap, and this. Now, 
while it might be ideal to make this rod be right at the centroid of this cap and the centroid of this cap, sometimes we will put those rods right at the extreme fiber so that if there's any attachments to the structure that are representing the extreme fiber, any pressures applied, that will give the appropriate values. That's the way I like to do it. Now what I'll do is I'll adjust these rod properties down a little bit to account for their line of action is a little further out. It actually should be in here, but we've modeled it a little bit further out at the very extreme fiber, so we'll put a little less area so we get the right eye. This shows the calculations for the values, and that is some of the hand analysis that needs to be done in order to give appropriate results. Okay. Now this is a totally different, I did this a few years later, uh, they came to me and they had had uh, some analysis of the banjo structure. So if you look at an MD-11, it has uh, and a DC-10, they have the engine, uh, three engines, one on each wing and one in the tail. And that engine in the tail is a lot more of an engineering challenge than it appears because what happens is you have to get the loads from the vertical tail, which can be quite significant, down into the fuselage, which is narrowing out. And you have this large engine weight that's hanging up there. So you have to get the loads out down and around the engine and then down into the structure. So we have, you'll see, if you look carefully, you'll see there are four spars that come down. They're like beams that come down like this. Beams and then they cant and then they go down in here uh, and tie into the frames. Beam, cants, and then it ties into the frame. Beam, it cants, and then it ties into the frame. Beam, it cants, and ties. Four big spars. And these spars, Basically, if you look at them, the like this part of them, they look like this. They've got these little tabs. These tabs down here tie into the frames, and this tab in here ties into the vertical tail, and this frame through here brings the bending loads around the engine, which is there. Okay, that's how it works. And when you look at those, they look like banjos. They look like a banjo. So these are called the banjos. Okay, here's a couple more views, detailed views. This is what that banjo looks like. This is the way I idealize the structure. If you take a look at this little piece here, you see we actually have a big flange. It's about this big and it's got multiple machinings on it. it comes down to a web that then gets thinner and each each little pocket, each little web has a stiffener and a cap, inner and outer cap and a pocket upon a pocket. And these are hogged out of a, let's see, a banjo, a big piece of metal that's nearly the size of this room and it's about that thick and then it's machined out so then they have canning effects and such. That's the way it's designed. They had 63 load cases that we had to flip either way. And uh, so if you take a look at a cross section through there, this is what your cross section looks like. And this is the way it's, it was modeled. I didn't make this model. What I had to do was extract the loads out of this model and analyze them. So this model was actually kind of a challenge to extract that. It would have been a challenge to do it by hand, but I wanted to analyze each and every little spot in this. I have a margin of safety for every panel. Within the panel, every flange of the cap, including a number of effects. So this is the way I idealized it. This is the uh, this is the um, sign convention. This actually was using this was done using what's called CASD. That's a, a McDonnell Douglas created program similar to Nastran. Actually, it's better than Nastran in some ways. Uh, uses the force method rather than the deflection method. Slight tweak on what we're doing. And uh, yet that fell out of use in the mid-90s because basically NAS trying to expand it so much and a lot of folks wanted to be universal, use the same programs everybody else was using. It actually had some uh, competitive advantages, dealt with some things better than NAS trying did. Of course, NAS trying dealt with some other things better, and that's one of the reasons why it went over CASD. So this is the sign convention for CASD and the way that's defined. This is the sign convention, the way that plays into my panels. And this is the kind of output. You'll notice these, because they use quad elements for these web elements, you've got gradient running loads all throughout the structure. It was very challenging. This is a cut in the uh, two directions, one in the along the hoop, a hoop cut, or a, a cut 
perpendicular to the frame, that frame as it goes around another one cut in the uh, upper to lower part of the frame direction, the radial and the hoop direction. These are the kinds of analyses we're doing for buckling of these things and I used plastic effects. Once again, this is breaking that down further, looking at each element in the model and how that's delumped. This is showing how the model relates to the uh, how the structure relates to the model and how that relates to the loads that I was getting out that I had to extract out of multiple elements. Each of these three sets of forces, one for the I needed to turn that into a force, moment, and shear in each cap in the web. And uh, in order to analyze this, plus plastic buckling effects, we learned about buckling in our class, but we only did elastic buckling. I wrote a Fortran program that would account for plastic effects, and this discusses some of that, along with the interaction curve. And this looks more and more about how I'm delumping. This talks about how I accounted for wide flange effects, some of the other challenges with the cross section and how those were dealt with. And then my program wrote out in uh, the for the webs and for the caps in the hoop and radial direction all the margins and for stiffeners, all the margins of safety for each and every load case, each and every panel. And then I went and analyzed it all by hand so they could see how that worked. So that's kind of a rather extensive example, one that you probably won't be ready to tackle for a while. Let's take a look at some rocket analysis. This is the way we report margins. So we talked before, this actually doesn't have the fairing. This has the inner stage, which in this case is a cone for this uh, version of the Delta IV rocket. Um, and this is showing minimum margins of safety and what the load cases are that we cre created, that we uh, found. So we got the inner stage, we've got the uh, tank, the LOX tank, you've got the center body, you've got the main, oops, the main tank, you've got the main tank, you've got the uh, low aft lock skirt, and then you've got the engine and the thermal shield along with the aero skirt and all those margins of safety. This is how we report. There was uh, actually a number of subgroups within our group that analyzed that were responsible for each of these pieces of structure and all they would focus on. One group just focused on the inner stage and another piece of structure. One just looked at the tanks. One just looked at the center body and so on. There's a lot of analysis involved with a number of analysts for each of these pieces of structure. And then we would pull together all their minimum margins of safety with some oversight for all of them and put them together like this to show that we were ready to fly. <clears throat> this is a late uh, flight analysis here. Late flight, no, this is actually still Mach 1.2. This is looking, this is a specific mission. And once again, here we're doing buckling analysis, and we're doing buckling analysis at one of the cutouts in the fairing. And so we're running an eigenvalue analysis. This is a little excerpt from the model. This model includes all the structures you see in the leftmost picture, and then you have a couple blow-ups that I pull out of my model. This is showing the uh, a um, one of the uh, radome, a uh, little where we put fiberglass. That's the lower left where it's fiberglass, so the some uh, things could go, some radars could go through that. And this is one of the cutouts with a, uh, with a, mm, with a, uh, uh, that's modeled here. And so what we're looking at the eigenvalues once again, and with the knockdown for sure crimping, this little close thing, you'll notice before we looked at the fairing, we saw those big, nice wavy pattern of, uh, of uh, the buckling mode. That is a typical cylindrical or conical buckling mode shape. When you see little spikes coming out of the model, that is not a standard buckling. That's like a shear crimping. That means you've got a low shear stiffness. And that's usually shown in these models like that. So this was shear crimping. We used a shear crimping knockdown, which is conservative. And then wrote our margin of safety on that. Once again, using the same approach, we take the eigenvalue we have the factor of safety, and uh, and in this case, all the loads for this structure were 1.25 because we had tested the structure, but this particular uh, load case was not, uh, this little area was not tested. It was not included in our test, therefore we changed it with no test factor by just putting that ratio in there, and that is how we wrote that margin of safety. 
Here's another eigenvalue analysis for one of the fairings showing critical buckling. This is for one of our customers. Here is a typical analysis of the, uh, this is showing the max compression throughout the structure and writing our margin of safety on max compression. You see what the stresses are and what the uh, thicknesses are. This looks like uh, this is using a, assuming we're using an allowable here for if the face sheet of a sandwich structure was not flat, had a face sheet wrinkling problem. So actually this is not written against FTU. This is written for a uh, higher level failure mode here. And this is details of the same kind of thing where we're looking at stresses. It looks like, uh, oh, this is stresses against face sheet ranking allowables in critical spots. Here is uh, another mission analysis where this is one of those fiberglass things so that we can see through uh, with uh, like a radar kind of thing. And this is how we report our margins of safety. This is an uh, exploded view of a fairing with all the various parts and the various margins of safety that were critical. So those give you some ideas about the kind of analysis that we do. This actually goes back to that early time in the 90s when I was doing a lot of modeling and we were comparing different methods of modeling structures. A number of people had done this kind of result of evaluation before and some of those guys were uh, highly respected and our group was trying to make sure we understood how that works so we evaluated this is uh, just a quarter ring model I actually look first at a quarter ring and then a full ring with a floor beam to try and understand the differences in modeling so this first one is using bars you'll notice each of these elements along here these are just a series of bar elements and this is the bar nomenclature this is a series of, this is using two quads and three rods to represent the structure. And this is how we have to debug those. This is obviously quite simple. You just get a shear, a moment, and an axial load. The second one means you're getting running loads. And this actually had, uh, actually this lower one is a, is a quad and the upper one I believe is actually uh, well it says it's two C quads that might be a shear panel some of them yeah that's actually a shear panel the picture I chose I actually looked at both kinds of models and then we've got those instead of bars we've got three rods representing the three pieces and then this is using three quads and you can see it gets even more complicated so going to a higher or a more uh, a finer model one that has more elements actually causes a lot of challenges in deep lumping and evaluating the margins of safety. How do we write the margin of safety? When we're looking at skins, we can just look at the pretty picture and grab the max stresses and the max running loads. But when we're looking at frames and things, we can't do that. We need to do detailed analysis with the axial load and the bending. So actually a bar is, uh, in my opinion, superior. It keeps it rather simple, loses a couple effects, but actually, even though these other two methods bring a lot of output back, they actually confuse what the loads are rather than improve the loads much. So this is what I did there and how I evaluated. Then I evaluated three frames in a similar manner, and what I did was I then looked at the three, the axial load running uh, the moment and the shear at a number of places like the middle of the floor beam, the center line, top and bottom center line, and right there on either side of the floor, you'll notice I've extracted the loads from the elements and plotted them out here and here and here and here and here and here and here. So you could see what all these different loads are. I had used that quarter ring model in order to understand what I felt was the best model and then I use this model to evaluate how much uh, how do these three relate which ones are giving a reasonable representation what loads does it represent well and which loads does it represent poorly this model here is actually just a bar model the bar goes around the structure like this. This is a bunch of C bars like this. So going from node to nodes, this is a C bar. This is a C bar and so on. And then these are all C bars and the struts are all C bars. 
However, FeedMap has a feature where you can take a C-bar element and you can actually just draw what the cross-section looks like with the thickness and everything else. And once you've drawn that, uh, it will calculate the properties for you and then you can call out that property card and it will put it into the bar. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of like a hybrid. Then when you show your model, you can either show the modeling itself which would mean that the structure is going to look like a bunch of bars as you see here or you can show it with that element uh, with that element shown and then it looks like this now all these details that have all this so it looks like the frame has depth it looks like the floor beam has depth but they only do in the properties actually this is just a set of bars that run along here and a set of bars that run around like this and here and here but because the properties have been defined have been drawn out in FEMAP as we see in that upper picture there in this picture right here when it shows the model it makes it look like you can kind of see what the structure looks like here so it's kind of a really cool feature I don't recall Patrain having that feature. It may, uh, but you can explore that. FEMAP does, and it's a very powerful little feature. Because then, instead of having to go and calculate all the properties of your model, you can just draw, uh, sketch out what that property looks like, as you would like in SolidWorks, and it will actually calculate the A and the I and all these other stuff, and it will dump it into your bar element. Now then the beauty is, so this is our model shown on the left. Then what you can do is show if you group these in separate groups, let's say you group the frame in one group, the floor beam in another group, and the struts in a different group, you can show the shear and moment diagram. So there's a set of picks in your menus, and I think, I don't recall if I showed you that yet. I think I did in the earlier FEMAP. So then if you show those, if you turn that on, so you're showing your, now this is important that, Remember, your bars have to be defined with the same, the same orientation, right? Your orientation of going node 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and the way you call it your reference node is important because if you flip those around, if you change the way you're doing it, then actually you'll get a reversal of these sure moments throughout the structure, which can be very confusing. If you actually follow the same convention going all the way around, then when you do your sure moment diagram, it will make sense. You can see from this, we're getting a spike where loads are now this actually had because of the structure remember there was a radome on top or something with a header and that's causing point loads and you can see uh, that you get little spikes in the loading this is the actual load shear and moment shown here for these structures let's see the rightmost one is transfer shear that middle one I think is axial load and that first one is moment the moment will also often wrap up, suddenly change wherever we have a load applied. As you can kind of see that spiky picture, the axial load changes more gradually and the uh, shear also changes kind of drastically. So by looking at these three <clears throat> shear and moment diagram, it's very easy to spot where do we need to analyze the fuselage. If that frame or the frame, if the frame has the same cross section everywhere, then all we need to do is check for positive bending and negative chip bending. The two places you can see this is causing compression on one cap and this is causing compression on the other. We probably need to look at both of those. We need to take a look at this and this and analyze whichever one is greater. It looks like this one up here is greater and it looks like that's the maximum spot for the other uh, reversed bending. So if you just do two analyses, one for a cross section with that moment and one for a cross section with this moment, boom, you're done. For sure you've got that clocks out the critical place is a little off center so you analyze that the same thing for now the floor beam you see here's the actual load shear and moment for the floor beam and this is the kind of analysis we would do this is showing the analysis of uh, is that the frame or the floor beam? i can't tell so that's how uh, a powerful feature for analyzing your structure so that's just some quick and dirty uh ideas for how Fine elements can be used in industry. I want to introduce a new NASTRAN card. This is the RBE2 card. This card is a RBE stands for a rigid uh, body element, I believe it is, which basically says 
that it's a constraint card that's constraining one node to another node. It's like a bar. A bar has stiffness, but a rigid body element has infinite stiffness for whatever degrees of freedom it's given. The way it works is you call out the card. This is RBE2. Given an element ID, that would be 1. Uh, that would mean if you're calling out that element. right? And then this is the grid, the first grid point in field three, that's the grid point that's independent. What that basically means is whatever that node does is going to be tied to all the nodes that follow it. This is like the leader of all the grid points. Grid three is the leader or the independent, the one that can do whatever he wants. Grid the everything the grid point numbers, the integer the integer grid point numbers in fields five and onward, even with a continuation card, those are other degrees of freedom that follow like little sheep. So if the grid point ID, let's say grid point, you put <coughs> ID 1 in field 3 and 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in the other fields that follow. What that means is this, this first grid point will move however the elements attached to it and the loads make it want to move. And all these other nodes will do exactly the same thing for whatever degrees of freedom you've attached. If you look at Field four, that's the component loan number. So let's say that we have grid one, and then in fields five through whatever, we have grids two through 10, like I said. And let's say we only put a one in field four. So we only attach the component one or the X direction. That means if node one has a 0.5 displacement, all these other nodes that are defined here will also have a 0.5 displacement. They will go with it as if it's completely rigid between them. So if this grid moves in the Y direction, those nodes won't follow because we only have a 1 in there. If it moves in the Z direction, those nodes won't follow. If they rotate, it won't follow. But if it moves in the X, in the one direction, these will move exactly the same way. That's what it does. Now if we put 1, 2, 3, that ties together all translations. So whatever translation happens, but if this rotates, these won't rotate. If you translate the four direction, that means if this rotates about the one, then these will rotate about the one and so on. So if you tie grid uh, the degrees of freedom one through six, that means whatever this node does, these are all going to do that too. All going to do that too. If you tie one, it only does one degree of freedom. If you tie one through three, that pins them together. Does that make sense? That's how it works. All right, so let's look at some best practices. We learned one Nastran card, and we learned some, uh, we got some ideas. Hopefully, you got a little bit inspired by some of the stuff I showed you. Okay, here is a little aircraft. We're going to want to define our <coughs> coordinate system. Often, for a coordinate system of models, we'll start at the front end. This is pretty standard industry. We will usually have positive X moving aft, and we'll have positive Y, depending some aircraft manufacturers will make positive Y to the right. That means using right hand rule Z will be up. It's actually more common to make positive Y to the left. So positive Z is down. At least that was how it used to be because load factors that are down. Those are the critical. Um, although uh, I kind of prefer to have Z pointing up. It's easier intuitively for me. That would make X back. If X is a longitudinal along your aircraft moving in the aft direction, then Y would be positive right and Z would be positive up. Okay. So you're going to make your model, you're going to strain your final model. Usually wouldn't do an, an entire aircraft, that's kind of hard to constrain. We'll do pieces of aircraft usually and then put them together. Okay, we'll, uh, let's see, we are going to load our aircraft. We will generally use C bars to use frames and C shears to model skin. Since you have a C bar at the uh, frames, a C shear, with F equals zero to model the skin. Now, for you guys, you'll notice that the C shear is actually rather difficult to use. And uh, so you may want to end up using quad elements, although quad elements will give you more stiffness than actually is there whenever you're in compression. Will you see rods for stringers? We'll constrain with a wagon wheel. So example, let's just say we're trying to model a fuselage. We would go and we would start by making a single frame and we would first call out all the grid points going around. We'd call out a grid point at every stringer location. Then we would make bars, C bar elements between those stringers. We would make sure that one of those occurs right at the top of the floor. 
Then we would put a floor by using a number of C-bars, and if we have a strut, we would use a C-bar to model that. That's a single frame. Then what I would do is I would take that frame and I would define this frame at some station. Maybe start with zero, or maybe start at your first station, which often might be like 300 or something out here at 300 be your first frame. Then what I do normally do is I would copy that. If I'm using Femap or Patran, I would co just copy that and I would translate a copy by how what whatever the frame spacing is, say 20 inches, and then another one 20 inches, 20 inches, all in the X direction. So then you can just copy and move. Once you create an entire frame, you can copy and move it. Then you'll notice you have all these frames created rather rapidly. You only created one, and then you'll put a C rod between each of the nodes at each of the stringer locations. So you get a bunch of rods. They go from here to here, here to here, and so on. Okay? And you're also, if you had created all these elements, then all those will be there. Then once you have that, you're going to go, if you want to look at the loads in this region, you'll probably add whatever the diameter of this is, you will add on a number of additional frames with skins. Oh, and then you're going to create your skins like this, right? You're going to create your skins, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You can actually do it this way, or you can do it this way, but whatever it is, make sure you're rotating. Your no joint orientation is the same for all of them going around. Otherwise, you can get a reversal of pressures when you apply pressure. Then you're going to end up making this at least one diameter or more beyond where you want to look at loads, and that's going to be your dummy structure, and you're going to attach it with a wagon wheel at the end. The wagon wheel looks like this. It'll be kind of like you can copy, you take your last frame and remove the structure from the inside, and instead just put a node in the middle. You can strain that in all six degrees of freedom and put a bunch of C-bars here. You can actually use rigid elements, RBE2s, or you can just put a bunch of, what's even better is put a bar that has a huge I value longitudinally and a really tiny area so that this can breathe. But if you're not looking near that constraint, it doesn't really matter that much how you constrain it because that's far enough. That would be a way to create a model super fast. Okay. This is talking about how to make that wagon wheel, giving some of those uh, little details of how to give it uh, large bars and those tiny areas. That's uh, so that's basically <clears throat> a quick a quick view into how to model aircraft. Uh, I would encourage you to based on this to go and model a frame. Make a frame. Try and make a little segment of fuselage structure. That's pretty easy to do. If you go, I should make this a homework problem. This is actually moving toward your last final project. But basically, once again. If you create a model and you put a grid point at each and every place where you want a stringer, you pick however many stringers you want. Make this puppy round. And pick a location for the floor and populate a number of grid points through there and where you're going to put your struts. Okay, You can actually do this with uh, by using the feature where you're actually putting in like... Uh, just a circle and lines, and then you can actually have it populate, put points on those lines, a certain number of points, and a certain number of points on this line, a certain number of points on this line in FEMAP. And then you can transfer those, transform uh, those points into grid points, and then transform this bar, this circle into bars. And these ones into bars, certain number of bars. Anyways, so you're gonna make C bars going around like this, C bars going here, C bars going here. Give a typical A and I for a floor beam. Give a typical A and I for a strut and a typical A and I for a frame. These probably aren't the same value. Frames typically look like this. Uh, struts typically look like this. And floor beams usually look like this. Right? Uh, and all these are just going to be, you're going to turn that into an A and an I, you're going to turn this into an A and an I, you're going to turn this into an A and I, and you're going to give all these bars, this property, all this with this prop, this property, and then all these with this property, right? Then you can go, you can start by actually just uh, constraining in the middle and applying some loads and make sure everything works properly and plot out your shear moment diagrams. 
Once you've done that, you can then take that model, copy it, and then take this frame, take all the elements here, and copy them 20 inches in the X direction. So if you look at the edge of this, you had one frame that looks like this actually, right? Your coordinate system, there's a origin back here, that's Y, and that's X. So you had one created at some station here, and then you just copy that puppy so you have another one 20 inches aft. And you copy, so another one 20 inches aft. Make about 100 inches a model, so 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. You have one, two, three, four, five, six frames. Okay. Then go ahead and put stringers at each place where you have, uh, so these are C-rod elements going from here to here, here to here, here to here. And then go in and put quad elements, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and like this. I'd start at the top and then go down, okay? One, two, three, four. Make sure that the rotation is the same for all the elements. What happens is when you apply a pressure, if the picked direction one two three four is going this way then positive pressure is going to be going in that direction if you then on a different element you pick in the opposite direction that means the pre are going to apply a pressure later and you'll have some pressures going this way and some pressures going this way you want to be able to find positive and negative and know which way they're going by using the same pick direction that will accomplish that so you're going to put quads once you're done you can put a wagon wheel here and a wagon wheel here and do something like apply internal pressure to all of this to all these quads then you can see how your structure deforms in internal pressure. Put a point load, say, at the middle of the floor, as if somebody put a big lavatory here, a couple forces on the floor, and see that. And then practice plotting out your shear and moment diagrams for the different parts of the structure. You can put your frames in one group, your floor beam in another group, and your struts in another group. This is getting a little ahead of ourselves, but actually we're moving toward the part of the class where we're going to be doing this because your final exam is just the final project and your final project is going to be making a segment of a fuselage and you're going to be doing all these things you can practice now so that later you're ready to go actually that project is going to be posting early more than a month early but you can practice some of those ideas now as you get ready for that i hope you found this inspirational i hope you found it insightful i hope you are inspired to start doing your best at mastering everything you can so you become a great engineer and go out there and do great things. Best of luck.